Good, Good morning, morning church. church! Welcome so to church this morning. It's so stoked to have you here. Okay, you go. No, no, you, you go. go. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay let's go. Good morning, church! It's, it's so, so nice awesome to be here this morning with the <laughs> Okay, come. Okay. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors uh -huh. on the other side. Ready? Okay. One, One, two, two three, three, go! go. Ah, there we go. Check that, I finally beat the Rock, Paper, Scissors champion ah. of New Life in Christ. Youth, you know what that's all about. This is the champion, now I am the champion. Defeated. Woo! Awesome. Well, welcome this morning to New Life to You, New Life in Christ's online ministry. My name is Matt and this is Caroline and we're so excited to have you with us here for church this morning. This morning is going to be awesome. We're going to have some great time of worship. Dimitri is going to be sharing a message on breaking free of spiritual deception. But ultimately, we're here to meet with Jesus today. So yes. get out of bed, get up off the couch, put wash down the face. coffee, wash your face. Let's get ready because new life is about to begin. Welcome back to New Life to You, New Life in Christ, South Africa's online ministry. It's so awesome to be here with each and every one of you. And we want to send an extra special warm welcome to each and every one of our regulars, our guests, and even if you're joining us for the very first time today, we know that Jesus Christ has a plan for you and that is why you're here. So be expectant. He's going to do some amazing things. I don't know if you like me, but I'm a bit of a history buff and something that I dig checking out is like on this day, the 16th of August in 1858, that's 162 years ago, wow. there was the first telegraph communication that went across the ocean between the United Kingdom, Great Britain and the USA, between Queen Victoria and the President of the United States. Oh wow. For those of you who were born in this century, <laughs> uh, like a telegraph was this like a form of communication across this long electrical wire that would stretch the whole way across there and a dude would sit on the one side with a little morse code tapping like, and that would be picked up on the other side. It is amazing how far technology has come. Yes. <laughs> like where things are no longer wireless. But this is an amazing, or no longer wired, they've become wireless. It's wireless, But this yeah. is an amazing thing where we can see the gospel of Jesus Christ, even right mm. now, how it's being broadcast from a, a studio in Cape Town all the way around the world, wow. like to the furthest parts of the world through this awesome medium. Isn't that right, Caroline? I think that is so, so amazing. Like even though we're from all different countries, different cities, from all over South Africa, we want to hear from you right now. Tell us where are you mm. watching from this morning? Which city, which suburb, or even which country are you watching from? We know many of you are from outside of South Africa. And this reminds me of in Revelation 7, yeah. where John writes about how people from all different tribes and nations and tongues were all gathered before the throne and the Lamb and how they were worshiping God together. Yeah, it's amazing. So right now, where are you from? Type that into the live chat or send them to one of our WhatsApp groups. Let us know where you're from. And you know what? Why not use one of those emojis all over the, there? Use one of those emojis to let us know what it feels like worshiping the Lord Jesus together this morning. Go ahead. We'll be joining you right there. We've got some exciting news for you. So on the 29th of August this month, get out your calendars, 29th of August, we are going to be having our first New Life in Christ 
worship gathering since March, which is going to be epic. Caroline, do you yeah. have more details for us? So looking forward to that, church. So even right now, put a little note on your phone, on your calendar, or wherever you diarize your events. Um, 29th of August, we've got two live services at the Milneton, the Woodbridge Primary School. Mm. So the one is going to be at 4 o'clock, and the other one is going to be at 6 o'clock. So you have to book, even today, just to secure your spot, because, you know, the numbers are limited and all that with lockdown regulations. But Matt, could you explain to us a little bit more how, of, how we can invite our church friends? and Completely. Everyone? So what's going to be happening is there will be a link on New Life to You. You can follow that link right down below. Here it is. You can find it there. I hope the editor manages to put it in the right place. But follow that link right below, and you're going to find a form where you need to RSVP for this worship gathering. Of course, there are still regular regulations that we need to face. The regulations might change slightly before then if the president decides to speak. But um, until then, we know that we are only allowed 50 people at a time. So that's why we're having two services. Mm -hmm. So space is limited and RSVP is necessary. Once you've been, uh, once you've RSVP'd, we'll be sending out a confirmation email to you with a couple of questions that you need to just fill out and follow. It's that whole screening uh, test thing. All so protocol. all mm. part of the protocol. So we can just like streamline everyone going straight in to worship together. Yes. Isn't that going to be amazing where we can just lift up our hands and praise God together again on the 20th? 9th of August. I'm so looking forward to that. Hey, Caroline. Yeah, so, so much. Can't wait to worship the Lord Jesus together. But you know, we don't have to wait. Even right now where you are, let us be like that multitude in Revelation 7 where they were worshiping and pouring out their praises before the Lamb of God. So even now, let us worship our King together. Sandy's so going to share a word with us from Psalm 145. Good morning, church. Let's read Psalm 145 together. My heart explodes with praise to you. Now and forever, my heart bows in worship to you, my King and my God. Every day, I will lift up my praise to your name with praises that will last throughout eternity. Lord, you are great and worthy of the highest praise. For there is no end to the discovery of the greatness that surrounds you. Generation after generation will declare more of your greatness and declare more of your glory. Church, let's praise the Lord together. Stand up if you have to and let's praise our living King. Amen. Sing 
You know, as Christians, we can often have really wrong views of money. And I do believe that today God wants to just change the way that we think about our finances. Firstly, I mean, like we can so easily uh, have two conflicting views about finances. Some of us, we think it's from the devil and should never be trusted money and other people worship it like it's the God itself. But God has been so clear in his word that finances are given to us or rather trusted in our hands. They belong to God and they're used for the ultimate purpose of glorifying him and advancing his kingdom. That's what our whole lives are about. Yeah. You know, in Luke 16, Jesus told a parable of this unjust sir steward who was losing his job. And right at the end, he started to deal really well with finances after squandering and uh, dealing unfaithfully with his uh, master's finances. And Jesus used this parable to teach us us the value of worldly riches or value of finances in our lives and in our service of God. In verse 10 to 13 of Luke 16, Jesus says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You know, this is what God is calling us to be, is to be faithful in what he has given us. I think that's such a challenge for me, saying that if you can't be uh, faithful with unrighteous mammon or these worldly riches, how could the master, how could Jesus trust you with what truly matters and the true riches and those deeper spiritual wow. truths? Yeah. And with that, we know that God uses finances to test us. And he does that in two areas. The first is to check our obedience to him. God has commanded in the word that that first tent, that first part of all of our finances belongs to him. He even says in Malachi 3, who are you that you would rob God by not bringing the full tithe to the storehouse? And so often we can hold back what is rightfully God's because that belongs to him. And we can find ourselves in that place of sin. And when we get into that position, things really do get wrong because it's a sin like any other in our lives. And this morning is a morning that God has told us that we can repent of that. Even right now, that we can be cleansed and we can get right with God by giving to God what is rightfully His. And then secondly, we know that God tests us in the area of our faith with finances. You know, it can sometimes be easy to give a little bit here and there if we've got a lot of money. But when we don't have much mm. and when we find ourselves in a position sometimes where we feel like feel the pinch, yeah. then it takes a lot of faith to be able to give what little we have to God. But God has shown us time and time again, he blesses that. Stephen, think about that boy with the loaves and fishes. He could have kept that to himself, but he knew that from that little amount placed in the master's hand, Jesus' hands, that it could be a blessing to so many. This is what God has called us to do, to not treat it like it's ours, and not think of what I can do with my money, but to give this across to the Lord and to honor Him and glorify Him with it. So right now you can glorify God by giving to the Lord. And in a few moments, Caroline's gonna pray for us, but on the screen now, there's various ways to give. There's the snap scan, uh, our card details are there, as well as EFT. You can use these ways to give to the Lord and to see His kingdom advance. Caroline, please pray for us. Let's pray. Your Father in heaven, Lord, we want to be found faithful, Lord, even with these worldly riches, Lord. We pray that we will not hold on to it as if it's our own, because it's not. Lord, it belongs to you, God. And I pray even right now that you will remove fear out of every heart. And Lord, let us give to you what is rightfully yours, Lord God. And we pray, Lord, that it will be invested into your heavenly kingdom. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, hello there, and thank you for joining us this morning for another message in this series, Break Out, Be Free. And today, our message is all around being set free, being delivered from spiritual deception. What a huge thing this is. And praise God that He has given us such a powerful gospel message that we can take out, that we can share out around the world and even here through our online media to get people to know that there is freedom from all sorts of bondage through the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to also let you know that there is a study guide. If you look down, you can see there's a link. Um, you can get the study guide as a PDF. It's there for you to use along with this message. And also to um, ask you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 26 in God's Word. We're going to be looking at a very key verse here in God's Word. So take your Bible out and um, yeah, don't just wait for it to come on the screen. Look in your Bible. You can even mark it out right here. But um, let me tell you while you are turning there, what a beautiful thing it is when people come to the realization of the truth of the gospel and they are set free out of the clutches of some kind of false belief system, false religion, some kind of sect, some kind of cult, and they come into the freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember a long time back, I was in the spur, I met a man talking to him, and as we began to converse, I sat down with him, got him a cup of coffee, and we began to talk, and it turned out he was a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, his knowledge of Christianity was, of course, so limited because everything that he had been brainwashed and taught about wasn't the truth. He believed false uh, things about Jesus, that Jesus didn't truly die on the cross for our sins. He didn't believe that Jesus rose again bodily. He didn't believe that Jesus is coming back and didn't believe in heaven even. And as I was praying, I was praying and just saying, Jesus, give me a word, give me a verse. And the Lord put something on my heart and I took my Bible out and I turned to the scripture and I said, won't you read this? And as he read the verse, I asked him to read it out aloud. I said, read this aloud to me. It was about the gospel. And as he read, then the spur, the Holy Spirit came down and supernaturally the power of God took that blinder off his eyes. And suddenly the whole gospel made sense to him. His name was Wilfred. It was such a beautiful moment as I could share the gospel, as I could see the power of God at work, and I could see deliverance come upon him. Uh, a time back, more recently, there was a young man who had come out of Islam, just a new believer, and I was discipling him and sharing the gospel, I invited him into our Bible school and he did a term and I can remember him every time because of all these years he'd been trapped in darkness and bondage um, when I would say a gospel truth and he would say it's the truth it's the truth because the truth had become so real to him he could see it and I hope that today you would realize as we are reading and as we are talking of truth and error that you would be able to discern the difference. And listen, it's not too late, even right now. If you know somebody who is trapped in a cult, a sect, a false religion, you can send them the link for this message right now. Won't you do it? But let's go ahead and read the scripture out loud. It's Acts 26 verse 18. Jesus has appeared to the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul, who at one time was a persecutor of Christians, that bright light is shone. He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, Jesus says, I'm Jesus. And then Jesus says, for this purpose, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is such an important verse. I want you to read it with me. Again, look at the words. I'm sending you to them. Read with me. I'm sending you to them 
to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What a beautiful verse this is. Now this one verse explains for us three things. Number one, what is spiritual deception? Number two, the dangers of spiritual deception. Number three, how can we be saved out of deception? And so we'll look at those today. Let's answer that first question. What is spiritual deception? What exactly is that? Well, look at that part of the verse where it says, I'm sending you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Now, the implication there is that the eyes of unbelievers are closed, that they cannot see, that they are in darkness, to turn them from darkness. And this is really, when you look at the religious world, what is so often happening is that truth and error are being switched. And so error is being presented as truth, and truth is being presented as error. And world religions are famous for doing that, even taking facts straight out of the Bible, out of God's Word, and distorting them and turning them around. Now, I'm going to give you an example of that. It's in Matthew chapter 28. If you want to turn there in the Bible, Matthew 28. And this is where the Jews had become aware, Jesus saying, after three days, I will rise again. I will resurrect. I will come out of the tomb. And so the Jews and the priests and the Pharisees came together. They appeared to Pilate, said, Pilate, listen, this deceiver, Jesus said he's going to rise again. So can we get a guard? Can we lock up the place, make sure, seal the tomb, put a big seal on the stone? And Pilate said, you got a guard, go for it, do it. And so this happens. And then, of course, you know, the angel appears and all the gods fall down. And and, um, the angel says to the followers of Jesus, Mary, that he's not here, he's risen. And now these soldiers, suddenly the tomb is open. Jesus is gone. He is risen. And it says, while they were going, behold, some of the God came into the city, they reported to the chief priests all the things that have happened. How Jesus rose again and the angels and reported all that. And when the chief priests had assembled together with the elders, they consulted and they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. They bribed them, in other words, and they said, now tell them, go out and tell, say the disciples came at night and they stole him away while we slept. Now, even this statement is ridiculous because how would they know this if they were sleeping, right? They're sleeping. How would they know the body was stolen and the disciples came? But be that as it may. And they said, if this comes to the governor's ears, because soldiers were not allowed to sleep on duty, they could be executed. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and we'll make you secure. And so, of course, the God soldiers love bribes. And so they took the money and they did as they were instructed. And listen, it says, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Matthew is writing about 20 years after the event. And still among the Jews, this false teaching was going out. And this was the explanation of the chief priests and unbelievers saying, The disciples stole the body. Okay, so can you see how they could take truth and exchange it for error? They could take error and exchange it for truth. This is really what deception does. And it's really like having a blindfold pulled over your face and walking around blindly because the Jews were believing this. Exactly what the chief priests goal was, was to deceive the people, even when they were presented with the truth. Um, You know, when Muslim babies are born, boy or girl, do you know that the first and the role of the father as that baby is born is to whisper 
into the ear of this newborn baby. In other words, the first thing that this baby hears in the world is its father whispering into its ear, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Muhammad is the messenger. And so the very first words that young born baby hears of its father is a lie. Just think about it, the deception that is in the world. Now today I want to talk to you about deception in its different forms and shapes. And that would include, of course, atheism, the belief there is no God. Would include the religions of the world, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, all those religions that contradict the truth that God has sent his son into the world. And that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he rose again from the dead. And of course, we could think of secret societies like uh, Freemasons. We could think of cults that have taken the Bible and changed important parts of it. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, for example. We could talk of, of um, traditional religions that are shaped by culture. African traditional religions, animism, spiritism, the occult. All of these are truth being exchanged for error, error being exchanged for truth. There is a real and a huge, huge danger because when we are talking today about spiritual deception, we realize of all the prisons that we have dealt with, this one is enormous. People struggle to get out of this one. Why? Well, if you think about it, you know, if someone walks up to you and slaps you in the face, you know it. If someone comes up to you and spits at you, you know it. If someone punches you, you know it. If someone, you know, says, you fool, you know it. But if someone deceives you, you don't know it. You don't know you've been deceived. This is the danger of deception. The people who are deceived don't know that they've been deceived. This came across to me um, so real many years ago, a um, husband and wife asked to meet with me. I went to a restaurant and we sat down and they began to tell me a story. They'd come to our church one Sunday and they began to tell me their life story. And their life story was one of being trapped for years and years and years in a cult. And they had ascended up in their level with this thing. And in fact, the head honcho in Cape Town, um, the wife was sort of, you know, his personal secretary, his PA. And for years, they had been so deceived. In fact, the, the sect that they were part of had said to them, they must give hand over all their possessions. They had given up everything they had. They'd sold the house, given the uh, the money of the house, sold their car, given the money, and, and they were staying in a compound with other people who were also part of this. But year after year after year, they did not know they were being deceived. So I asked them, I said, well, how did you come to cry? How did you, you break out? She said, I was, it was one moment, we were in a board meeting, we were sitting there, and suddenly... It was like my eyes were open. It was in an instant. And I tell you, someone was praying for her. It was in an instant that it just the whole thing came away. And she suddenly realized this is phony. This is not true. This is not God. And it was just in that moment. And she went to her husband and spoke. And as she spoke to him, suddenly it was like the blinders dropped off his eyes. But just think of all their lives. And man, they were in bad shape. We began to counsel them. But psychologically, I mean, their heads were messed up year after year of this spiritual abuse that had been taking place in their life. Maybe you in such a situation. And I pray for you that God would set you free through the power of his word, the power of Jesus Christ. Well, the second thing that we can see in this verse, if you look again at Acts 26 and verse 18, where the apostle Paul, God is sending him, Jesus is sending him to rescue, to get people out of darkness to light. And he says from, now notice these words, from the power of Satan to God. And this is the second thing that we learn 
about spiritual deception is that spiritual deception is not only error, but it's also terror. Being under the power of Satan is a terrible thing. And, you know, when you think of what our Lord Jesus suffered, the terrors that he suffered upon the cross, the way that he was handed over by the religious leaders to be crucified. You think of Paul, the beatings, the stoning, what he suffered. And, you know, many missionaries, as they've gone out around the world, as they've shared the gospel in different places where there have been different religions that have been established, they've experienced the terrors firsthand. Let me give you some examples. You know, in China, which is a Buddhist and Taoist um, country where those have these religions and Confucianism, they've got a terrible practice of going back, and this has been for many hundreds of years, thankfully not practiced anymore, but they would take their children, a four-year-old girl or five-year-old girl, six-year-old girl, and they would break her feet and then take the broken foot and they would tie it back, pull it with a cord and bend it underneath her foot so that the foot would grow deformed. And they would, in their way, they were trying to cause the foot of the woman to look like an animal hoof. This is one of the terrors. And of course, um, Gladys Alwood, Scottish missionary, fought against this um, heart and soul. But here was a practice that was a terror in a world of false religion. Another one, Mary Slessor, when she went into West Africa and of course under the African traditional religions and witchcraft and spiritism, there she discovered the practice of taking when a woman would give birth to two twins. The belief of the people was that that twin, one of the twins, would be possessed by an evil spirit. And so, of course, they wouldn't know which one. So what they would do is they would take both the twins, either kill them or dump them, leave them in the bush. Mary Slessor found many abandoned babies that way. And of course, she began to look after them and to care for them. But such were the terrors of false religion. David Livingston, when he went into East Africa, he discovered firsthand the terrors of Islam. When he saw long lines, processions, of slaves, Muslims, slave traders that were taking men and women out of villages, chained by the neck, taking them across in boats and to Zanzibar and then sending them out into different areas. Of course, the terrors of slavery. So Winston Churchill, in fact, he wrote about the slavery that even women experience in Islamic society. He said in Mohammedan law, every woman must belong to some man as his absolute property, either as his child, or as his wife, or as his concubine. Philip Scaffer, historian, he said the moving power of Christian missions is love to God and man, but the moving power of Islam is fanaticism and brute force. And of course, the terrors we know, we've all heard of Sharia law, the laws of retribution, where People are treated in extreme ways. If a man steals, he has his arm cut off and a woman's caught in adultery. She is stoned and even accused of that. Terrible. And of course, we know the bloodshed that is um, in Islamic fanaticism where anyone, according to the Quran, if anyone doesn't hold to Muslim faith, he's an infidel. He may be killed. And so a terrible religion. And then, of course, in India, what did missionaries discover? Well, they discovered the practices that women had of going and offering their children to the river god, the Ganges River, drowning their children as sacrifices. Or the practice which was if a man died, they would take his wife who was still alive, even if she was young, 20s or teenager, they would take her and they would burn her alive or bury her life. And these are the evils that we see so much in religion. Now, why is this? Why is there so much terror in these false religions? The reason simply is because the power of Satan is there. Just the way that Jesus was saying to Paul to deliver people, set them free out of the power of Satan 
to God. Third and last point. What is God's response? What is the response of the Lord Jesus Christ when he looks at a world that is trapped in false religion, a world that was trapped in deception? What is Jesus' response? Well, look at what he says. He says to the Apostle Paul, he says, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes, to free them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is the power of the gospel. The gospel has got power to turn men from darkness to light. We're going to, in a few moments, just watch some testimonies of of two believers have been delivered and set free by the power of the gospel because Jesus is sending out people like the Apostle Paul realize that we have got a calling like Paul to share the gospel. Listen, as the church, we need to be apostolic like Paul going out to share the gospel with those that don't know or are caught in error to bring them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. I think that there are a lot of Christians that are not apostolic, but they are apathetic because they don't care. They say, well, you know, if that person is a Muslim, just leave them alone. They've got their religion. You've got your, I've got my religion. Let them be. We'll be good friends. I won't tell them about Jesus. I won't tell them about the deception that they caught in. I won't tell them about the error. I won't tell them about Jesus who wants to set them free of their sins and give them eternal inheritance. My friend, if that's your attitude, that is not love. That's hatred. It's a lack of compassion. When Jesus looked at the Jews who were trapped in Judaism, it says he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep having no shepherd. Does that sound like apathy? No. We've got to minister to these. I think of that Samaritan woman. I absolutely love that moment where Jesus comes and introduces her at the, at the well to the living water. He says, woman, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. And suddenly it's her eyes, her Samaritan, her unbelieving Samaritan religious eyes are open and she comes to know. And Jesus, she says, who is this? And Jesus, I who speak to you am he. And at that moment, she drops her water pot and she runs to the village. And she says to the village, people who follow her same religion says, come meet a man who taught, taught me all I ever did. Could this be the Christ? But she wants to go and spread the good news. So I pray that that's your heart, that when you look at the religious world, at the error, at the confusion, at the terror, you would want to go and share the good news with them. But let's go and watch these two testimonies right now and see how the Lord, even in recent years, is setting people free from religious and spiritual deception. In my late teens, my early 20s, I was what would have been called a goth or metalhead. You know, the guys with the long black hair, wearing black clothing, and listening to scary music and skulking about in the shadows. And as much as I tried to deny it, that darkness of the subculture led me into a darkness spiritually. What started off with dabbling in the new age, you know, with like yoga and crystals and meditation and star signs and oils and incense and all of that, soon that darkness spread and led me towards paganism, towards the occult, and towards witchcraft. Soon I found myself just surrounded by friends who were Satanists, friends who were witches and wizards and occultists and all sorts of new ages. We had such a broad spectrum, but there was one thing in common, and that was the power of Satan in our lives, where Satan was holding us bondage to his will and to destroying our lives and leading us down a path of destruction. You see, the allure of the occult and of witchcraft and paganism, New Age, is the sense of false power, where you feel like everything's going wrong in your life and there might be a crystal you could hold to change that or spell or ritual or something like that that would give you power over the universe and power to influence your surroundings or the people around you. Meanwhile, 
all it was doing was taking me deeper and darker into Satan's grubby little hands, where he was just playing with my mind and taking me onto a path of destruction. So many of those people, of the Satanists and the witches, are no longer around today because they took their own lives. And I know that, the, uh, that Satan even tried to do that in my own life, where he led me to a place of suicide. There was one night which was a huge turning point for me. I got involved with the Coven of Witches out in Durbanville and we'd meet together and partake in rituals and various other things. And one night there was this arch priestess that was there. She was like the head of a national organization of witches pretty much. And we we're sitting at about two o'clock in the morning after like some ritual or some um, thing that we had been doing. And we we're sitting around the fire and she said like, you know, why do we do this? Why do we even bother? Because there's only one God that has the power to change lives and only one God that it actually answers. And that's Jesus. I remember hearing her saying that and I got so offended because I was so caught up in this occultism that I wanted to hear nothing of Jesus. And soon after that, I would parted ways with them and I found myself walking down a path of atheism. And you know what? Atheism is so the same in terms of spiritual deception because it's the power of Satan again to blind us to the truth that is Jesus. For me it changed when uh, my girlfriend at that time, Caroline, now my wife, got saved or rededicated her life to the Lord and I saw the power of Jesus Christ to change her life. At that time I hated it, at that time it repulsed me. But the more I saw this person who was an alcoholic and a smoker and unrighteous becoming righteous and holy, the more I saw that this was a power outside of her and this was the true God, Jesus Christ, who had done this. She had prayed for me and a couple of times and I saw how the Lord had come and worked in those situations and I saw the power of God. Eventually I, I agreed to go to church and I had heard the gospel truly for the first time. I heard what Christ did upon that cross and the Holy Spirit made this truth so alive to me that I gave my life to the Lord. Right there I was saved and was brought from darkness and into light for that first time. My eyes were open and those deceptions fell away. And much like we read in the book of Acts, you know when these guys turn from their idols, they had to burn their scrolls and burn their idols. This was something I had to do. I had to throw away all that old stuff, get rid of those idols, even tear down that deceit that I found in my mind. And I found that as that, that was going away, that Jesus Christ replaced those lies with truth and He replaced that darkness with light. And here I am today that I can just praise Jesus because He alone is the one that has power to set us free. My name is Fatima, or you can say Fatima. In Cape Town, they say Fatima. My name is Fatima. Why is my name Fatima? I was born in a Muslim home. I found myself in a Muslim home. So, all I knew was everything based on Islam. I have never in my entire life heard of a name called Jesus, being born again or baptism nothing all i knew was muslim religion we used to go to the mosque on fridays funny enough i went to the muslim as a child for the gift not for the love of islam because when we went to the mosque on fridays and as a child people were giving you papers coins papers money and whatever so that was fine for me we didn't have christmas christmas never existed we had Eid. So Eid is known as the Islamic uh, Christmas, you can say. So only at the age of 14 going to 15, my parents divorced. I understand uh, people have different perspectives based on divorce, but my parents' divorce came with my salvation, with my deliverance. So our parents divorced at the time, we were in Port Elizabeth, and then my mom took us, we came to Cape Town. When we came to Cape Town, she took us to a school, a Christian school called the Isaiah Christian Academy, or the Ark. It's in Forry, on Forry Road, yes. So from there, that's when I heard the name Jesus for the first time. 
that is where I ate pork for the first time because you can't tell people I'm a Muslim and I cannot eat pork. They cook pork, pork for everybody. So from there and then I heard about Jesus, I heard about Christianity and I was so determined, I was so surprised is this person is the son of God and the whole history of Jesus and he will come back one, one day to come and fetch his sheep children now i was so determined that i didn't want to be left behind when jesus comes i wanted to be among his sheep i went knocking on a pastor's door early in the morning i remember it was um yeah it was 50. knock on a pastor called pastor jude I spoke to her, my background, and I really want to accept Christ because I don't want to go to hell and I still don't want to go to hell. So she opened Jeremiah. Jeremiah, yeah, Jeremiah 1 10. Wait, uh, yeah, if I'm right, where it says uh, when God sent Jeremiah and then Jeremiah said, I am too young, then God said, I will go with you, I will go before you. She read for me and then she prayed for me. Ever since then, I started following Christ and I stayed at that school for five years. And I got to know the deep things about Christianity, which I continue to know and follow up until today. There have been too many, too many attacks. I'm talking about phys uh, spiritual attacks. If you speak to anybody who was in a Muslim religion that will tell you it's blood-based, I was mostly given by my father as a covenant, as a, as a sacrifice to that kingdom. So for me to just, or for God to just remove me out there, it was, I don't know, it was a battle. My deliverance itself take, took over two years two years I had all kind of spirits all kind of spirit if it's in the modern society today if like, like African I would be known maybe as a witch I'm not a witch but I would be known as a witch because I had too many spirits I had spirit of cats dogs monkeys uh, marine spirits all kind of things and then when I was delivered the, they would take videos then they would show me after Anyway, thank God for the man of God he sent in my life who prayed and prayed and prayed and stood for me because they were sure of the Christ they had in them, so they prayed for me. I remember even the day after I met that uh, pastor prayed for me, I went to sleep back in the dorm. When I went to sleep around 2 a.m., and everybody was sleeping but my spirit wasn't awake and boom the doors went open the windows went open and it was thunder thunder lightning and then this person walking it was he was just a giant i'm sorry to say the example he looked as if he was undertaker for those who used to watch wrestling and those who are watching wrestling he looks he looked like undertaker he walked in he walked in he walked and as he walked everything trembled so he stood at my bed when he stood at my bed and he stretched his hand each time he wanted to touch me i got up and i sit he removed his hand each time he wanted to touch me i removed, uh, got up and i sat guess what it was lucifer himself coming to check this little girl who was now in this uh, uh <laughs> where i was initiated and given as a sacrifice and exchange and all those kind of things so after that in the morning i asked did anybody see thunder rain nobody it was only me so from there fights continue spiritual battles continues if you look on my face my forehead closely you will see there's a scar i am not the one who put the scar there this scar was put by my father wherever he took me i was six days old i don't know what they did i don't know what they placed in there but i found myself growing up with that thing there and if you speak swahili the swahili people will know chanjo it's called chanjo like uh, they i don't know what they do they cut or put bones dead people's bones or whatever i don't know what i know is christ has set me free 
I am free indeed and um, I could never imagine of me going back to Muslim to Islam or being an Islam each person I hear of somebody who was in Christ and moved to Islam it really cuts me deeply it's it's hurt me deeply I wish that I could talk to this person please don't go don't go don't go because I know I know where I was and there's so much which I still don't know but there's a lot that I know but anyway thank God for Jesus thank God for setting me free my daughter's name is Victoria victory Victoria, and I keep my name I keep my name when I got baptized into Christianity, <laughs> my name I chose as Hope. So if you want to call me, you can always call me Hope or you can call me Fatuma. When I say my name is Fatuma and people look at me, my daughter is Victory. It's like, what's going on? You understand? But I keep my name as a testimony. If somebody asks me why is your name like this, then I will explain to them why my name was like that. But anyway, thank God for my life. I thank Jesus for coming for me, for rescuing me. They continue with attack. Sometimes attacks that I cannot tell to anybody because the, a person will think that I'm crazy. But it's only me who can hear those things. It's only me who can say those things. So sometimes I don't speak. But uh, there are people who pray for me. People who pray for me 24-7. Mostly people who prayed for my deliverance. People who continue to pray. And... Um, yeah, I've met the new life as well. So I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I am not dying based on those fire and the ceremonies and the incantations we done there and the being offered and whatever. Jesus is much bigger than that. So I hope you've learned something. And uh, sorry if I see this two minutes. It's just that I have so much to say based on my life, really. It's like a book. If I have to speak, of where I come from and where I am today it might take a month but I hope you've learned something from the little that I have spoken God bless you all God bless you all please if you are thinking of being a Muslim please it's a no-go it is a curse that you are laying for your generation for your children for your children's children for your children's children the sad part is you don't even know so God bless you well you've heard these two amazing testimonies and you've seen firsthand the fact that even up in this generation we're living in, that the Lord Jesus Christ is delivering men and women from spiritual deception. Opening their eyes, doing exactly what he said he would do in his word. Now I want to ask you a question. Are you in some form of spiritual error, some form of false teaching, some form of deception, where you feel like you've got a blindfold over you and you want to be set free. You want to be delivered of that. How can this happen? Well, I want you to look again at that verse that we started out this day sharing. It's Acts 26 verse 18, where Paul says, Jesus says to Paul, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. There are a couple of things here when you look at this that you can do today. And the first thing is you can ask the Lord Jesus to remove the blindfold that is upon you. You can say, Lord Jesus, I pray today, remove the blind, whatever it is, the error that has come into my life, that is sitting inside of my soul, that is causing this blindness of my heart. Lord, I want to ask you today to remove it because he says he will turn them from darkness to light. The second thing is to receive forgiveness. He says in the same verse that they may receive forgiveness. You know, when you talk of receiving, it's something that you take. It's not something that you make. You can't make yourself good enough for God. Um, that's the one thing I think with all people who are trapped in some kind of religion is that they never feel like they're good enough for God. Why? Because they've got no consciousness that their sins are forgiven.
the basis of having your sins forgiven is believing on what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, how God sent his son in the world, that Jesus died upon a cross, that he took the punishment that you and I deserved upon his own shoulders, that he wore that crown of thorns upon his head, that he became a curse for you and for your sins. And all you have to do is to believe on him and to receive that forgiveness of sin. So receive it. Say, Lord Jesus, today I accept you as my Savior from sin. Receive. And then thirdly, renounce the works of darkness. Now, this is important. Not only do you ask the Lord to remove the blindfold and you receive Jesus, but renounce the works of darkness. If you got in your house, I mean, there's a account in the Bible in the city of Ephesus where people went and they took all their religious books, they burned them in a big bonfire. If you've got symbols and idols or anything that is connecting you to that false religion, the spiritual deception, get rid of it. Whatever it might be a picture up on your wall, get rid of that picture. Remove, renounce. Break every tie and every connection. And so ask the Lord to do that. And it says to take them. Notice it says from the power of Satan to God. In other words, that you will receive a deliverance because this is what Jesus says he wants to do for you. He wants to completely deliver you, take you out of Satan's grip, out of the error and the spiritual deception that is holding you. He wants to deliver you completely. That's your desire. I'm going to pray for you right now. And I trust in the power of God and just the way that God called Paul to go minister and bring people out of darkness. God has called me into that ministry. And I want to pray for you right now. And as I begin to pray, you are going to sense the Holy Spirit moving upon your heart. And you're going to sense and you will feel that deception lifting off of you because this is what the Lord does. The most powerful word is the Lord Jesus saying, I'm sending them, I'm sending my followers like the Apostle Paul to bring people out of this bondage of darkness and bring them into light from the power of Satan to God, that they may be sanctified, made new and become holy men and women through faith in me. So won't you pray with me right now and reach out your hands as I reach out to you. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for that man, for that woman who is hearing this message and is trapped in the chains of spiritual deception. Right now today, I pray in Jesus' name, break that chain, set that person free, remove that blindfold that is over their heart and over their mind, help them to see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that it is the power of God unto salvation. And Lord, I pray that you would completely deliver them because you said, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, it's not my prayer, but it is the power of the Holy Spirit. And as I pray, I ask, Lord, that you would do this through the power of your name. And I pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you say amen to this? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that even today you are delivering men and women and boys and girls, setting them free through the Lord Jesus Christ. So go ahead, share this out, share this message, send it to those you know that are trapped, that are caught in the clutches of spiritual deception, that Jesus would set them free because this is what we are here for to share the good news all around the world. So God bless you and have an awesome week. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if that message ministered to you and you found yourself in a place of spiritual deception or spiritual darkness, then today is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to open up your eyes and take you from darkness and into light. He is the one that died on the cross for your sins, that you could have eternal life in him if you accept him and believe in him as Lord and Savior. Let today be the day of salvation for you. Come out of the darkness and out of bondage and let the Lord Jesus give you a new life and where you can be part of God's family and be part of his kingdom. So let us pray together 
and you can receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior from mm. sin and to make him Lord of your life. Let's pray. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner and have broken your holy laws and come short of your glory. Thank you for loving me and for sending your Son Jesus into the world to save me. Today I turn to you and receive your offer of salvation. Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior and Lord. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again to life on the third day as the Bible testifies. Please wash away all my sins and give me the gift mm. of eternal life. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come into my heart and take control of my life. Transform me from within and make me holy and set apart to God. By your power, make me a bold witness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, you can know that the Bible is true, that it says whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. But Jesus said that he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So I'd like to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer, head across to newlifetoyou.com, newlifetoyou.com. Head down to the next steps and you'll see a button there that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. Click on that and let us know of your decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ today because one of our leaders would love to get in contact with you and help you walk along this path into your new life. Heaven is rejoicing with you because today your name is written in that book of life. Amen. And to everyone else, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's been awesome to be able to have church with each and every one of you. But I want to ask you, help us reach our goal of reaching 1,000 subscribers, the 1,000 sub club. <laughs> yes. yes, even right now you can give us a like or hit that notification bell. Also subscribe, share this video with your friends and family. We want the good news of the gospel to go out to all nations. Amen. The more subscribers we have, the more reach that this channel gets and the more that we can actually do on YouTube and we can see more of the gospel and the good news going out. You know, this has been a really exciting time, even though we've been in lockdown. It's been awesome because we've been seeing the Lord grow ministries. A couple of weeks back, Karin and Dimitri were sharing about how we've been building up the studio. And I want to give you good news that even this last week that the Lord provided us with proper lighting as well for the studio. So things are coming a lot, are coming along a lot better. And Karin even wants to share a little word with us quickly. Thank you so much for being part of the work of New Life in Christ through the ministry of New Life to You. As you can see over the season, God has been building an incredible studio and work and ministry here through New Life to You, through your generous giving and donations to the ministry. And for this, we thank you. As much as we know that God is on the move and we want to move with Him, we're excited about building up this ministry through New Life in Christ. We're wanting to ask you to continue supporting and feeding into this work so that the gospel and the message of making ready a people prepared for the Lord can get out not only to our nation, but across the countries of our world. They've seen as we've been growing in this further need for equipment and computers, lighting, camera, and we're asking that you get on board with us and be part of this ministry through your giving into new life to you. On the screen below me, you'll see various ways that you can support the work that's going on here in Cape Town, South Africa. No matter where you are, you can be part of what God is doing. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, your support, and we're excited about what God is going to do through your lives and through your generosity. Thank you so much for that word, Karen. We are expecting to see our Lord do great things. So we want to thank you so much for joining us today. Share this message again and we'll see you this evening at, uh, as Jethro shares a message on Jesus, the light of the world, followed by communion in our connect groups. We love you guys and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.